few months ago, William Schneider Jr. arrived at the Caps Media Center with an absolute treasure trove of Ventura history. Bill's father, William Schneider Sr., was a highly respected teacher throughout Ventura. For years, his hobby was recording on camera interviews and family histories with fascinating people all over the county. Recently, his son, Bill Jr., gathered together more than 100 tapes from his father's archives and working here at the Caps Media Center has painstakingly restored these treasures. Bill's new series, called My Father's Stories, explores some of the very early days of Ventura County. Most of the videos were recorded 20 to 30 years ago. The people, places, and stories Bill shares are part of Ventura's rich history. Welcome to My Father's Stories. The stories keep going and going, and one just fascinating, every one of them. So who's, uh, who's next on your list? We're going to actually talk about three different people. Uh, it's called the Doctors of Satakoy, Doctors of Early Satakoy. And um, this first doctor I'd like to talk about is Dr. Grace Sharp Phil, a, a woman doctor, of course. And at that time, there was no women in the medical profession. It was very unusual for a woman to be a doctor at that time. And I can imagine all the hardships she went through in order to get her doctorate. Uh, she, she, went to, she was born in 1875 near Santa Rosa Valley and was the oldest of eight children. Her father was a very hard-working rancher by the name of James Sharp. And she attended Santa Paula High School and graduated early. She was always fascinated with the, the medical industry. They even named a hospital after her, which is up on Foothill Road. Uh, the next doctor will be discussed in this interview is Dr. Cruden. Dr. Cruden was a general physician, general practitioner in uh, Satakoy. He had his doctor's office right next to the uh, bank of Satakoy in downtown Satakoy. Uh, at that time, he did everything for the patients from, from tonsillectomies from, to setting a broken bone to stitching up a hand through an uh, industrial accident or something. He's quite a guy. And also back then, there wasn't a lot of money. People didn't have a lot of cash money. People were, were, were land rich but cash poor. So Dr. Cruden would accept payments in the form of a pig, chicken, eggs, a goat. That's what kind of nice guy Dr. Cruden was. Uh, the next doctor that will be discussed in this interview is Dr. Charles Hare. And uh, on a personal note, Dr. Charles Hare brought me into this world. And uh, that's how long I've known Dr. Charles Hare. Um, he graduated high school uh, in Satakoy, or Ventura rather, and got his medical degree from the USC in 1945. And he specialized in surgery, so he did a lot of surgery st studies. So he came back to Satakoy wanting to stay here, wanting to go to work at Satakoy. So he approached Dr. Cruden, and he wanted to partner with Dr. Cruden. Dr. Cruden was very wary about that because Chuck was a, a surgeon. He specialized in surgery, and, and Cruden, Dr. Cruden wanted a, a, a general practitioner. But Dr. Cruden relented and accepted Dr. Hare into his practice. So I'd like to present to you the doctors of Satakoy. Very cool. Great. What more fitting place to begin our story of memories of Satakoy's doctors than here at the J.M. Sharp home, where one of the early doctors, Grace Sharp Phil, was raised. And we have her grandniece with us. How are you, Pat? Fine, thank you. And I see you've taken very good care of the old home. Well, I've tried to. It means a lot to me. What do you remember about Dr. Grace? <laughs> Many wonderful things. Uh, she was a, a character, told wonderful stories to all of the great nieces and nephews and oh did things like raising chickens and bringing us the eggs and raising strawberries and and gardening beautiful tulips uh, always always with a good story not a very young age maybe about a hundred years ago it would be mm -hmm. she decided to be a doctor yes Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I don't know too much about it because, strangely enough, those were stories she didn't talk about very much. Um, her father was the family doctor, although he wasn't a doctor, but she does write about him uh, inoculating all the 
kids in the family for smallpox and <laughs> and sewing up or bandaging up uh, all the kids whenever something happened to them. Uh, she first went to Berkeley, as I yes, remember. Yes, she went to the University of California, which she really didn't like very much because she felt kind of lost uh, coming from such a small place as Santa Paula. Uh, and it was while she was there, she definitely decided she wanted to be a doctor. Her mother was against it, but she got other encouragement and went to Cooper Medical College, which later became Stanford. And there it was a smaller group. She enjoyed it much more. Uh, she was the youngest of the women there. There were some other women. And they got kind of a bad time, I think, from Ex some of the other, uh, some of the doctors on the staff. Extremely unusual for a woman to go through yes. med school at that age. Yes, it was. Or Listen, during that in those age. days, it was extremely unusual for a woman to go to college, to period. Do, to do anything, right? <laughs> so, uh, but, but she did well in medical college, and she got lots of practical experience uh, at the time she came home because both Dr. Bard and Dr. Strong in Satakoy let her go around with them and gave her lots of, of uh, you know, on-the-job training. This was horse and buggy days, too. Oh, oh horse and buggy days. And like, but her practice was not... Well, she developed tuberculosis during her last month at oh. Cooper Medical College and was advised, of course, to quit. But she didn't want to. She was determined to be a doctor. And she had heard about what was called the Black Forest Cure for TB. And she decided that she was going to do that. Uh, she managed to make it through to gra till graduation, which she did in 1899. And uh, came back to Satakoy, took over while Dr. Strong was going to, semin to a seminar back east. And she, she took over his practice while he was gone with with the encouragement of Dr. Bard, treated a lot of people with typhoid and did some childbirth cases. And uh, then she and a cousin bought a ranch up in the foothills, spent five years there working hard out in the open, and she beat the, tu she the beat tuberculosis. Her. Did she ever say what her fees amounted to? Well. Mostly uh, things in kind, although I believe she did get $50, 50, I think it was maybe 50 gold pieces or something oh, like really? that. It was quite a fee. But most of the time, I guess it was a chicken or... A couple of chickens or a dozen That eggs. kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. She never gave up her interest in medicine. And in later years, I mean, her dream was to have a hospital in Santa Paula. And as a matter of fact, I believe the first organizational me meeting for the Santa Paula Community Hospital was held in the living room right here. <laughs> and later when the hospital was built, I think Grace spent, she probably spent four out of five days up there. And she would take vegetables from her garden, take them to the kitchen up there so those people could have fresh vegetables in their, on, in their meals. And she also served on the board of trustees up there for a number of years. And uh, it, it was her dream come true, I think. That's true. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I have an article here written by a, a, a compadre, a fellow named Joe Paul, Jr., and, I, and his charming wife, Rowena. And Joe uh, was spent a few years in the great metropolis of Satikoy, and may I read this? There is a time almost in everyone's life, where he has a feeling that now is forever and the time will pass without really changing anything. And thoughts of the future are hazy. It's inconceivable that it will end. That usually happens in one's teen years when, when very little time is spent facing reality. That the lifespan really is fleeting. A snap of the fingers and it's over type of theme of things. Because this is true, I suppose I figured 40 years ago that there would always be Doc Kuhn. Although there were a few who always referred to him thusly, it was a misnomer, and actually contrary to the feeling that existed. 
as far as the community of Sadikoi felt, and as far as I felt, Alexander Wesley Cruden was never doc in the sense of being an old country doctor. He was a very young country doctor, actually. He was frequently referred to as the country doctor in a Cadillac because of his habit of doing a lot of fast traveling from his home or office to his patients' homes or to the hospitals. That particular make of car fit the saying better even though he drove a wide variety of makes during his doctoring years. When he and his young and still growing family came to Sadikoy four decades ago, he not only answered a long felt need for a doctor in the community, but he brought a new era of pride. Those of us who had lived for a while in Sadikoy soon picked up the practice of those who were long timers of feeling sorry for those who never knew the grand feeling of living in Sadikoy. And when we could add to that smugness the boast that we also had the best doctor in the county, we did so with gusto. It's hard to imagine that young, vibrant, enthusiastic, capable Dr. Truden is gone. The vitalness of the man makes that a rather difficult truth to conceive. Even though he'd been critically ill for a number of the last 10 years, there were times when he rallied to show that, that same indom indomitable spirit. And just a few short weeks ago, he attended the reception honoring 50 years of wedded life for Dr. Douglas Penfields. And he looked and he sounded great. It made it seem only yesterday that Doug, as a village dentist, and Wes, as a village doctor, teamed up to give Sadikoy a medical center. <clears throat> Looking back over the intervening years, it was most difficult to sift out all of the very special events in one's family when the doctor became an inseparable part of the clan's history. The doctor, of course, was there for most of the very meaningful events, and it's easy to forget that he was doing the same thing for a number of families, not just our own. Because he set my broken nose, I may have been the culprit that did that too. <laughs> <laughs> because he set my broken nose and put a butterfly bandage on it as I sat on the sawhorse in his not yet completed office, I always felt that he was my first patient even though he had made house calls before he got the office open. I wouldn't tell you all of the reasons I felt he was our very own personal doctor, but I would like to share one incident now that he wouldn't be embarrassed by my telling. Some time back, when our oldest was graduated from law school, I got to thinking about all, all those things that made it possible for him to go that far. <coughs> one of the things that came to that came to mind was the time that he was a baby with a high temperature and he went into convulsions. And the family doctor came and sat through the night as much to calm the frightened parents as to treat the child, as I thought about that. I thought of the numerous other times something like that had happened. And I sat right down and wrote a letter to Dr. Crude listing all of them and how much they meant to us. I'm so damn glad now that I wrote that letter. Of course, Sadikoy was just a very common, commonplace little hamlet. And Dr. Cruden was just another rural general practitioner. But you'll never convince me of that. Good. I thank you for reading Joe's article. I also, what we claim to be the first and the last patients of Dr. Cruden. He delivered my granddaughter, who is now 30 years old. It was the last baby he delivered. I remember Dr. Cruden. I was in the eighth grade, and I had gotten a tummy attack and he came to the house took blood out of my ear and decided I needed my appendix taken out so he <laughs> carried me out to the car took my mother went down to St. John's Hospital the old one took my appendix out and then every day after that while I was in there for a whole week he would bring my mother down to visit and then bring her back home when he was on his ground that's the kind of things he did but one day Dr. Cruden uh, didn't like to have the doors Polished in any way. He was afraid somebody would slip. And we shared the waiting room in the hall. And so when he went into the service, Dr. Penfield decided to varnish those floors. Nobody would slip and everything would be fine. He went in the front door, forgetting that the back door locked only with the key. Unlocked only with the key. He painted went in the front door, painted the waiting room, mm -hmm. 
made it down the hall, got to the back door, and when I got there Monday morning, there were big footprints walking <laughs> away and down the hall. I said, what happened? And he said, it's none of your business. <laughs> when I was about 16, I went to Dr. Cruden because I had lacerated my hand. And uh, in the process of taking care of that, I told him that I was planning on becoming a doctor. Well, he was very busy, obviously very busy that day, and he had people waiting in the waiting room. But after I told him that, he spent about 30 minutes just talking to me about becoming a doctor. So he used to do. And from that point on, he became something uh, of an idol for me. The man <clears throat> is, uh, is, is a, a monument, what I think, a monument, to the kind of things that I have been able to see. Now, I came into the family from the outside. I was the first one. I was raised in Ventura, and I kind of liked this lady, and I wanted to do something with this family, and so I came into the family. We were married. We had the reception over on Darling Road, and as we were getting ready to leave, and we, I was, I was in the service at the time, Mary Bell married me for my money. <laughs> I earned, I earned $72.50 as a private E2 in the service, and so we had to get over that. On the way out, though, my father-in-law says, Jordan, he says, there's something important that I want to talk to you about. He says, I think you better come in here to our study. And he says, now I want you to pay attention to this, he says, because I think this is important to you. And I said, all right. I thought, uh-oh, what did I do wrong now? And he said, now I want you to remember this. And he said, I don't want you to forget this. He says, she's all yours now, and I don't want her back. <laughs> what attracted you to the great town of Satikoy? Well, when I came home, Santa Paula was my home, and my mm -hmm. wife, Jerry, of course, is uh, from Ojai. And uh, when we were discharged from the service, we came home to, the, uh, to Santa Paula, and uh, I didn't know what I was going to do, except I wanted to start practice I'd had. Mm -hmm. A couple of more years of surgical training while I was in the service, which was uh, very fortunate. And in those days, you didn't have very many specialists, so you did family practice by and large. And so uh, I was went to St. John's Hospital in Oxnard and to Community Hospital in Ventura and met some of the doctors. And they suggested that Dr. Cruden, who was a senior physician in uh, in Sadako, I was looking for somebody. He was very busy, and so I He's interviewed with him and saw him, and uh, he hired me. He was the only physician in well, Sadako. <laughs> he was the only one in Sadako and uh, one of the few in the counties. So we had our county medical society meetings at the Colonial House. About 20 of us would gather yeah. there. Practically no specialists in those days. The only neurosurgeon was in, uh, was in Santa Barbara. And there was one orthopedic surgeon uh, uh, here in Ventura. No OBGYNs except, well, later on there were, but uh, not then. Do you remember any specific tales that you might uh, want to tell about... Uh, Dr. Cruden? Yeah, well... Yeah, well, he was a super guy and uh, a dedicated physician, a family doctor. Did all the types of surgery, including stomach and gallbladders and, and, and uh, pelvic surgery in, in those days, and was an excellent uh, general surgeon as well as a family practitioner because there weren't... There was one general surgeon who was had been a family practitioner, Pick Homer, and Jim Moore later in, or at that time in Ventura, none in Oxnard. And we used St. John's mainly because many of his patients had come from the ranching families on the, uh, on the other side of the river. I learned a great deal from him uh, in general surgery, and uh, he, was, uh, he was an excellent teacher, very compassionate man. But uh, some of the stories, he was so dedicated to his practice that he, he didn't care for the social part of, right. uh, of life, and his wife, was very interested in the social portions of, uh, of things and would put parties on and have affairs and, and go to places and, and go to parties. And he never cared to do that, but he always had an out. He said, uh, well, just tell her I'm tied up here and I have a patient in the hospital. So many, many times, even though he really didn't have, he would use that as an excuse. And uh, she knew, I think she knew, and uh, we got along fine. One time, he was away for some reason at a medical meeting or something, and she fell in her house, and they lived right next door to us, which in retrospect was fine, but probably today wouldn't work with uh, people being in such close proximity, but it worked for us. She fell and broke her leg, and so she called me panically. She says, uh, Dr. Hare, and that was shortly after I joined him. I was just a young 
whippersnapper and hardly dry behind the ears. I was 28 years old. So I went over and um, said, you know, well, you've broken your leg. Well, she said, I want you to do this. And I said, no, just a minute, Edith. You are the patient. I am the doctor. And that's the way it's going to be. I'm telling you what we're going to do. You're not telling me what we're going to do. We're going to take care of you. We're going to get it taken care of and under control. She said, fine. And since from then on, we were dear friends. And we got along fine. So. And the last doctor on our list, who, sh who would better know about him than one of his old dental hygienists, Marion Catlin Maxson. And she's going to give some stories about Doug Penfield that probably you haven't heard before. Marion? Actually, when I first started to work for Dr. Penfield, I wasn't his hygienist. I was his first dental assistant, and the year was 1938. And he had been in Sadakoy for three or four years, I think. And we had learned to know him well. He always insisted that, that I was in a Sunday school class, but I wasn't. He taught Sunday school. But he came into dentistry the hard way. He worked his way up, and he would go to dental school for one year, and then he would take time out and work for a year or so in the oil fields. and. Um, then he'd go back to school, and he graduated in 1932. And he was the old man of his class. I understand that they called him Grandpa. By the time he got to Satakoy, he was a well-settled young man with three children and a lovely wife. And he was very much part of the community. And everybody loved him. And everybody thought, I was so lucky to have that job as his dental assistant because he must be such a fun man to work for. And he was, but it had its drawbacks because he was sometimes a practical joker and uh, sometimes just a typical dentist. It was depression and he had to do all of his own repairs, he thought. And so some of my most hairy moments as his assistant was when he decided to fix the plumbing and I would stand and number the parts of whatever he was taking apart so I would know what order they went back together in. But finally I learned that it was wise to call the plumber when he started. And the plumber was at the Satakoy Hardware. It was usually Vic or Joe Muzio, who didn't really know much more about dental plumbing than Dr. Penfield did, but, but, uh, but they, they got it back together in better order. But his oil field years came back to haunt him, or in some ways me, especially because in the oil fields you have, you have uh, nicknames, and they're not always very kind or very flattering, and usually very much to the point. So his old oil field buddies discovered that their friend Penn was a dentist in Satakoy, and they would come running out to see him when they had an emergency a tooth that hurt or something, and, and uh, could he please do something about it right now? And I was the only assistant that he had, so I was usually busy doing something else, and he'd say, sure, Andy, come right in, and we'll take care of it right now, and he, Andy would sit down, and and the tooth would be taken care of, and and uh, and I was going on about my business, and. And when Andy left, he'd say, send me a bill on that, will you, Penn? And Penn would say, sure. And then when he was gone, he'd say to me, send Andy a bill, will you? And I'd say, well, what's Andy's name? He'd say, I don't know. We'd always just called him Andy Gump. And I was supposed to find out Andy Gump's real name. He was a very thoughtful man. He, he would, uh, it was depression and people didn't have money. And sometimes he got paid in paper flowers and and little things like that. But he was great on temporary fillings for people that um, really couldn't afford a, 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 the proper filling, whatever their tooth needed. And he'd say, well, we'll put this in, and when your job improves, or when you're a little older and have a job of your own, and your dad isn't paying your bills, well, then you can get yourself a crown or, or a filling or an inlay or whatever it needed. My favorite story about him I wasn't there, and it was it was a story that has been told because John Martin contacted me to get some 
something to say at Dr. Penfield's memorial service because he didn't know him very well, and I did. And this was a story, as I say, I wasn't there, but the Penfields and the Crudens and uh, Louis and Betty Norton and all of their children, when their children were children, uh, went one Easter out to the desert camping. And uh, they, had, they had fixed eggs before they went to hide them for the children to hunt and dyed them and, and uh, there was one egg had each child's name on it. And they knew that, that Dr. Penfield, because he was always with the kids, loved kids, that he would be with them hunting the Easter eggs. And so they dyed one and put his name on it, but they didn't cook it. And uh, then Louis Norton and Dr. Cruden, uh, when the big Easter egg hunt took place, they were following him around with cameras, waiting to, to see what he would do with that egg when, when he discovered that it wasn't cooked. But, well, he found it, and, but he put it in his pocket. And so they sort of put their cameras away. They thought, this is it, and uh, sat down to breakfast. And the children were at one table, and the adults were at another table. And suddenly, there was a big hullabaloo from the children's table. And it was Mary Bell Cruden, and she was yelling. Somebody said, Mary Bell, what's the matter with you? And she said, Sandy broke his egg on my head, and it hurt. And she was crying. And Dr. Penfield said, Mary Bell, don't be such a baby. He said, that doesn't hurt. He said, I always break my eggs that way. And he picked his egg out of his pocket and smashed it on the top of his head. And the egg, uh, of course, and everybody was laughing so that nobody got a picture of it. And the only reason I knew about it was because the next day, Monday, the telephone started ringing as soon as the office was open. And people were cackling like hens and crowing like roosters and making all sorts of of little chicken noises over the telephone. So finally he had to admit that, that the reason his hair was so fluffy and shiny was because he had had an egg shampoo the day before. I'd like to tell a few experiences of mine with Dr. Penfield. He used to call Jack Tobias and Bob Bryston and I and take us out to Fred Pittick's barn. He used to be out in the corner of Telephone and Main Street. There's a big red farming or mule barn, hay barn, and Fred had made that into a badminton court. And uh, Fred and his daughter Mary would just wax us, uh, but uh, we had an awful lot of fun. But we'd do that once a month. Penn would call us, and away we'd go. It was a great evening. I know Penn used to tell me about when my father would go in for some dental work, you know, fixing cavities, and Penn had a, had a bad habit of whistling. And he so enjoyed it when my father said to him one day, he says, Penfield, if you're going to whistle, would you please whistle on key? Penn liked to sing, but he did not sing on key, as I remember too much. One of the great things that Penn did for our community and a couple of surrounding communities, each year he would go to Sadekoy School, to Mound School, and to Montalvo, and he would inspect all the kids' teeth. Just look for cavities. And he did this for several years. And if you'll notice, there is a Penfield School named after old Penn because of his work as a school board member in both our community of Sadekoy and for the county school board. I think Penn was one of the great guys. He, he served us well. He supported his church and he was always ready to give free advice to anyone on at any opportunity. <laughs> and I miss him.